let me give you three reasons for being optimistic. I think I'm obliged simply by the title of the, of the summit to, to be optimistic here. So let me give you a, but I, I, I actually am mostly, with some qualifications, uh, quite optimistic uh, about India's prospects. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more. And I think o over time, when, uh, when the world thinks about rising powers, it will be shifting its focus increasingly to India, um, uh, and at least a little bit away from China, which is, uh, it is, has been the, the, the lead story so far. Um, the first one is um, people. Uh, both numbers and uh, uh, and qualifications. Uh, so one of, uh, one of the panelists yesterday said India has a lot of smart people, and it does. It's uh, uh, it, there's there's clearly a, a cultural um, reservoir of creativity, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, on a level that I think back in the bad old days of slow Indian growth, no one could have imagined. But that's clearly there. And look, the widespread uh, widespread uh, fluency in English is, uh, is an important thing, even as the United States gradually loses its preeminent status. Uh, nonetheless, English is the, world, is the language of global commerce, and that's got to matter. But also, there's just plain numbers. Um, in the, uh, uh, if you try to think about national economic de uh, destinies, it matters a lot um, how many people of working age you have. Uh, if we're trying to analyze, you know, we, we talk now, there was a time, I'm old enough to remember it, when Japan was about to become the world's leading economic superpower, which obviously never did happen. Uh, and it didn't happen for a couple of reasons. One was that the Japanese uh, uh, rapid uh, productivity growth slowed down, that Japanese technological progress didn't stop but no longer seem to be unstoppable. Uh, but the biggest reason why Japan has receded on the world stage is simply demography. Japan with very low fertility rates, uh, cultural aversion to immigration. Um, Japan has a working age population which is now shrinking at about 1.5% a year. And so even if you actually adjust for that, Japan's economic performance the past 20 years doesn't look too bad. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a declining factor on the world scene simply because there aren't enough Japanese. Um, believe it or not, China is starting to look a little bit like that. China's working age population appears to have just about peaked now and will be headed downwards in future. And that's a, a legacy of the, the one-child policy, various other factors, but uh, China is, um, is not going to continue, it cannot continue to grow at the pace it did uh, simply because of population. Plus, I would say in the case of China, a lot of their growth came from taking people from a backwards agricultural sector and moving them into the modern urban sector. And that process has probably reached its limits. So China has, has reached that point. India doesn't look at all like that. India's working age population is projected to grow uh, substantially. It will... Uh, um, it will substantially exceed China's working age population uh, in just a few years and will continue growing uh, for quite some time, um, which is potentially a source of a lot of economic growth. One, one good way to have a, an economic superpower is to have a lot of people working productively, and India certainly has a lot of people. So that's a, uh, a very, very important uh, uh, possibility. Of course, you have to find jobs for those people. And that's going to be one of the issues that we need to worry about a little bit. Come to that in a bit. But uh, assuming that that can work, India has the demography is, is on India's side in terms of its future economic role in the world. Um, second source of optimism is simply that India is still quite poor, still quite far behind the technological cutting edge, um, which is not a good thing, but means that the opportunity for catch-up is still there. I mean, you, can, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot expect to have the kind of growth that emerging Asia has had if you're already at the technological frontier, which is why Japan it can no longer uh, be a country of rapid growth. Uh, but India is still 
so much of India is still far behind, and of course, particularly uh, if we if we look at rural areas. Uh, I, I was uh, struck again by the Prime Minister's speech talking about rural electrification. Um, that's not, believe it or not, that's not ancient history, even in wealthy countries. If we go back to the United States, one of the major projects of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal in the 1930s, was rural electrification. Because in, in, in the 1930s, most of, uh, of rural America did not have electric power. Uh, so we're now talking about, um, but the point is that you have the opportunity now to bring hundreds of millions of people into the modern world. And that in turn means that there's a tremendous source of growth uh, potential at least that, that is, is not available for countries that have already done that. So that's a source of, of forward motion. Um, the third source of optimism um, is the distinctiveness of India's role in global trade. Um, as I said, India, it's completely unique and unprecedented to be as much of a service exporter as India now is. Um, that uh, up until the rise of India, all of the success stories in the developing world had been based around manufactured exports. And that's a, that's a good thing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and uh, in fact, India needs to do more of that. I'll say more in a sec. Um, but, um, but for the first time, um, we started to see large scale exports of services from a developing country. Uh, that is, if we ask why, why did that become possible, and the answer is uh, information technology, the internet, uh, that, that is clearly something that there are just many things that used to be impossible to provide except uh, on a very local basis that can now be outsourced to long distances. So the opportunity arose to, to start doing that, and it starts with, with uh, relatively low-tech stuff like call centers, moves on to all kinds of information technology, other services. Um, India got a head start. India began doing that before anybody else. Uh, does it on a scale that nobody else can match. Thank you very much, Professor Krugman, for a very well-rounded perspective spanning a century and uh, several paradigms. Oh, well, uh, let me start where you ended, populism and protectionism. Uh, we, and I'm sure many of us here, are more worried about uh, that part. Prime Minister Modi raised that as one of the dangers in Davos when he spoke about terror, climate, and protectionism as the three dangers. Now, uh, going back to the United States itself, uh, you know, the U.S. deficit with China is as high as $375 billion. And uh, President Trump is already talking about uh, imposing tariffs on another $60 billion of Chinese imports. Uh, how do you see this panning out? Will there be retaliation? Will that uh, bring down global growth? Is it, is it going to look really terrible in a year or so? Okay. Um, so the, the political economy of, uh, of protectionism, uh, first of all, just will this happen? Are we actually going to see a trade war? Are we going to see widespread imposition of tariffs? Um, until about two weeks ago, I was, in fact, quite optimistic that it would not happen. And the reason was not because the, the president would get good economic advice, uh, but because U.S. business um, is so thoroughly invested in, uh, in a globalized economy. Uh, we, we, these, this, um, these value chains where a product is produced in, in many places um, is, are, are pervasive. All of, all of the investments that business has made for the past 20 years were based upon the assumption that, those, that an open trading system would continue. And so there's an enormous amount of physical capital you know, of, of, of past investments that are at risk. There's actually a large number of jobs. You know, people complain about it, but in fact, uh, there, there are an awful lot of, of, of jobs in the United States and in Europe which are in plants whose existence depends upon the continuation of these value chains. Now, the problem is um, I had assumed that the influence of the business community would be sufficient that whatever the protectionist inclinations of Donald Trump, 
uh, that it wouldn't happen. I'm a lot less convinced right now. We've just seen his, his uh, reasonably sensible uh, National Economic Council head uh, fired. Uh, we've just seen um, a, uh, a completely irrational set of tariffs imposed on, on steel and aluminum. Uh, so it's, I still think that probably we step back from the brink, but the risks are certainly up to now, you know, 25 or 30 percent that we will see a, a, a really disruptive global trade war. You would expect Chinese retaliation. So, I mean, how serious can it get and how quickly? Oh, um, things can move. I mean, by the standards of internet time, they don't move that quickly. But we could be talking about uh, over the course of a few months. Uh, the, the most immediate um, issue, I think, is going to be, um, it is going to be actually a, um, confrontation not with China but with Europe because the, uh, the steel tariffs uh, are going to hit the Europeans. And the European Union, uh, whatever else uh, its limitations, operates as a, collectively on trade. And, and it's just as big as the United States. So there will be widespread retaliation against US products if, if this goes through. Um, and in the case of China, now you might say, well, China runs this huge surplus with the United States. Um, how much? retaliation can the Chinese do. But here's where the complexity of the global value chain comes in. Uh, those the U.S. runs a large bilateral deficit with China, but much of the value of those products is actually not Chinese. It's actually from other places, including Japan. And, uh, so the, the possibility of a souring of relations on trade, not with uh, just with China, but with the whole of Asia, uh, becomes very large. So no, we could get... Uh, you can easily tell a story where a series of tit for tat, uh, not just retaliation, but as friends of mine used to say, the biggest danger is not retaliation, but emulation. If the United States doesn't play by the rules, who else will? And so that could be a, a really big deal. Uh, well, what about the F uh, US Federal Reserve? I mean, there is a huge fiscal deficit uh, that will come probably because of the cut in taxes yes. and the expenditure. And at the same time, if you have uh, you know, problems of uh, tariffs, that also increases uh, the cost uh, to the economy yeah. or inflation. So should we expect very quick increases in uh, Federal Reserve rates? And if that happens, what happens to countries like India? Will there be a problem of financial dislocation? Okay, India is less exposed than most. But yes, I mean, I think we are looking at faster Fed rate hikes than, than previously anticipated. Uh, this, uh, this tax cut is a if, as an economic stimulus, it's very badly designed, but it still increases the deficit quite a lot. Uh, if we have tariffs, that also is, uh, is inflationary. Probably not exactly expansionary, but anyway. It's, uh, um, and the Fed, uh, there's been a noticeable shift in tone from the Fed. I've been, uh, you know, we, we, we look a lot. Uh, I, I follow uh, insider tip, follow uh, Lael Brainerd, who is probably the most dovish member of the board. Um, and uh, also one of my students, by the way. But anyway, the, uh, um, but, but she is sounding much, much more hawkish right now, and that's an indication that I think the Fed is heading for higher rates. Now, India is not heavily exposed with large dollar debts. Uh, some other emerging nations could be really uh, quite badly hit. Well, uh, I will try and take questions from uh, the audience. Uh, so the mics will come to you. Uh, uh, let me just uh, fit in one more question before the mics go, uh, please, to this table. Uh, uh, Professor, what about China itself? I mean, Xi Jinping has just gotten, elect, got, gotten himself elected probably for life. Uh, how do you see Chinese instability uh, padding out? Yeah. Uh, by the way, this is a huge disappointment uh, for global optimists. I mean, one thing that we had hoped was that um, economic progress and gradual democratization would go hand in hand worldwide. That we would be seeing, a, you know, no one expected China to turn into uh, India <laughs> uh, the politically um, overnight, but we were hoping that it would move forward and instead it's moving backwards to, to strongman rule. Um, now China, the, I would say that China is, is a, uh, 
is a financial crisis waiting to happen. Trouble is, I've been saying that for about seven years, so, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean it isn't still true. China is a wildly unbalanced economy with still investment of almost 50% of GDP, sharply diminishing returns to investment, not enough consumption demand to justify the investment, um, unable, even with all that, to generate the kind of growth rates that would justify the investment. And what they've been doing is they've been sustaining it with, uh, with uh, a credit bubble. And you keep on thinking that one of these days it's going to crash. It keeps not happening, but we do have something we call Dornbusch's Law after, uh, after one of my old teachers, uh, which is that the crisis takes longer to happen than you could possibly imagine. And then when it comes, it happens faster than you can possibly imagine. So I do think that there's a Chinese, um, a significant risk of a Chinese bubble burst. And having a government which is strongman rule, lack of deep-seated political legitimacy is not something you want at a time like that. Oh, well, uh, there's Navneet Munnoth over there. He's, he manages uh, several trillion rupees of funds uh, from the State Bank of India's mutual fund. Uh, go ahead, Navneet. Hi, Paul. Uh, you can, if you can stand we, up, please. We, we are all concerned about the reversal in the trend of globalization, but can it lead to another globalization, which is the globalization of localization? Everybody tries to produce locally, which leads to higher investment, reduces income inequality, and also lower environmental footprint. Okay. Um, so the answer there is, uh, I mean, the possibility of a trend towards localization is, is you know, uh, uh, is, is, is real. I mean, that, that has happened before. That happened uh, in, in the interwar years. It happened... Uh, in developing countries after, uh, after they gained independence um, after World War II. Um, it didn't work very well. It was a, it was a failed strategy of economic development. Um, in terms of the environmental footprint, um, look, uh, the uh, shipping of goods is not a major source of, 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 uh, of, of greenhouse gases. It's some, but uh, um, you know, the, the overwhelmingly most important source of greenhouse gases is coal-fired power plants. Uh, and after that, it's, it's uh, personal transportation. It's, it's cars and trucks. And it's, uh, uh, so it, it, this is not uh, really an important... Uh, it's, it, this is not where you would want to go if, if you're worried about, about the planet. Um, and income inequality, is just, it just won't make that much difference. I mean, I... Back of the envelope, I've asked, what would happen if the United States got into a trade war and that basically just shut down and we eliminated our trade deficit completely? Um, you know, we used to have 35% of the workforce in manufacturing. We now have only a little bit, under eight, a little bit over 8% in manufacturing. Suppose we did all of that, how much manufacturing will we get back? And the answer is we would, we would still be under 10% of the workforce in manufacturing. The, the sources of the big changes in income distribution are not primarily globalization. They are technology, they're changes in, in political institutions. Uh, so uh, this is not a solution you should be looking for. Oh, and, and, and the, the impact on some countries. Try to imagine what would happen to Bangladesh if the possibility of apparel exports, which is really what keeps that economy afloat, was cut off. We would be talking about Malthusian crisis. So this would be a, that would, this would be a terrible thing if it happens to the world. Oh, well, I think we have time for only one more question, and since the mic is already there. Yeah, Professor Paul. If you can introduce yourself as yeah, well. Dr. Sarjit Dudeja. Professor Paul, can you share your perception about the mind of President Trump? For the last so many years, he has been very rhetoric, and now he has changed to have a friendly relation with North Korea. Is it an economic or political or social compulsion because China and Russia is taking support to the North Korea? How things are moving that way? Oh, my. Uh... Gosh, I thought by coming here I could get away from Donald Trump, for at least for a little bit. Um, no, I mean, the, the trouble is that, uh, I mean, as it turns out, we happen to have uh, someone in the White House who is not at all given to... He, he doesn't take the job seriously. He doesn't, he doesn't say to himself, I am the, uh, the most important official in the world. I had better do my homework try to understand the issues, try to pick the best people. He just goes with uh, 
these are my gut feelings. I'm going to hire people who, uh, who make me feel good. Um, and uh, that's a, that is a pretty frightening prospect. And certainly on these economic, well, both on the, I mean, the fact that uh, of, of you know, nuclear weapons, it, that I don't even want to think about that. But it, on, on the economic issues, not only is it, you know, his gut feelings are protectionist, but he has an image of the way things that sh should be, which is about 50 years out of date. He wants America to be a heavy industrial country in the way it was when he was a young man. And that is just not going to happen. But the attempts to make it happen can be extremely destructive to America and to the world as a whole. Professor Krugman, we're completely out of time. I know there are questions, but the next speaker is waiting. Thank you very much, Professor Krugman. Two gems I take away from this conversation. You don't get to Denmark levels with Chinese levels of corruption. There's a lesson for all of us there. And the other gem, uh, President Trump is not taking his job seriously. That's interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Krugman. Thank you.